Hi, I'm Yang Wu, a assistant professor in social work in Jiangxi University of Finance Economics. I take you on a virtual tour of pottery art in China. My talk today consists of four parts. First, I will tell you a little bit about how Chinese pottery was exported to and duplicated in Europe. Second, I'll give you a brief introduction to the history of pottery in China. Third, you will get to know how pottery is produced. Finally, you will take a look at Jingdezhen, the pottery capital in China, and learn about how young artists and potters thrive in the city. Now, let's go to the first part, pottery in China and Europe. During the 13th and 16th century, much of Europe was seized with a manual for imported pottery, which was considered to be a luxury, like Ahmes and Louis Vuitton now. They were even called the white gold, as sometimes it was more expensive than gold during that time. As pottery was very expensive and was dominated by China, the Europeans they wanted to make their own pottery. Their initial duplicative attempts failed, as they did not know either its main ingredients or its manufacturing techniques. However, the manufacture of pottery used to be a top national secret in China. During that time, foreigners were not allowed to stay in Jingdezhen overnight. In this case, many industrial spies were sent to China from Europe. Among them, the most famous one is Frank Coys. Axel de Ancois. He is a French missionary, came to China in 1698 and stayed in Jingdezhen for almost 10 years. He earned charts from local developers and thus get permission to enter kiosks and discover the secrets of pottery making. Then he sent several letters with all the pottery manufacturing details to France, which later became public and the Europeans began to make their own pottery, leading to a considerable threat in Chinese pottery export. I will show you a video clip made by my student, and we will tell you more about the relationship between pottery in China and Europe.十六世纪地理大发现和新航线的发展，进入欧洲市场的中国瓷器正在稳步增长。中国瓷器在欧洲道路上会发生什么变化呢？下面我们一起来走进中国陶瓷博物馆，来看看吧。中国的瓷器因为其特殊的材质、形状、颜色而受到极大追捧，成为只有贵族人才能拥有的奢侈品。人们用金银饰品来装饰它。欧洲的商人发现这一商机后，来到中国进行大批量购买。中国的手工艺人也根据欧洲人的需求来改变它的颜色、形状，例如在其中加入番石榴花纹、家族徽章等。欧洲人也开始自己仿制瓷器，并且融入自己的文化特色。瓷器也逐渐从奢侈品转变为日用品，比如下午茶杯具、房间装饰等Thanks for watching this video clip. During the late 17th and early 18th century, European pottery was duplicating the Chinese pottery. Then they began to show some unique characteristics, such as Western line styles, decorations, shapes, and added edge from cattle bones, 
while making pottery, and thus the bone china was invented. Bone china is milky white and has light transmittance. The first and most important part of the secret: what is pottery made of? The main and secret ingredient of pottery is a special type of clay called kaolin. Or in China, or the China clay, the word kaolin actually came from the Chinese word gaolin, which literally means high hills. It is the name of mountain where this specific type of clay was mined for centuries. Guess where this mountain is located? Yes, it's located in Xindezhen, the pottery capital that we are going to talk about later. What makes kaolin so special? Kaolin is widely used in the ceramic industry for two main reasons. First, it has a high fusion temperature and wide burning characteristics. Which makes it particularly suitable for the manufacture of pottery. Second, when mixed with water, kaolin can be molded into different shapes under pressure, and when the pressure is removed, the shape is retained. From this slide, you can see that originally glazed stone can be turned into exquisite artwork. Samples of kaolin were first sent to Europe by the Angkors. Around 1700, as examples of the materials used by the Chinese in manufacturing pottery. After learning the relationship between pottery in China and Europe, we are moving to the second part: the history of pottery in China. The history of Chinese pottery could be dated back to the 1600 and 221 BC, where proto pottery was invented. It was the transition from pottery to pottery. Later, during the 25 and 220 A.D., celadon was invented. It is the earliest real pottery in China and shows a yellow and blue color. It is similar to proto pottery in terms of shape and decoration, but it is different in the chemical composition of the glaze and has a higher firing temperature. Of 200 Celsius degrees, the third stage is symbolized by white pottery in 386 and 581 AD. While, for, while white pottery is blue and white, however, pottery was still in its infancy during this time. During 616 and 907 AD, pottery manufacturing began to flourish. That's when the olive green pottery was invented. From the two pictures, you can see that pottery wheels made during that time were quite different from those made in earlier periods. This kind of pottery is called mi se ci, which literally means palace pottery using secret glaze recipe, as its glaze recipe remains a secret. It is glaze green. Crystal clear and moist, but looks quite different from celadon. It was clear as ice and as green and moist as jade. However, before 1987, people do not know what olive green pottery looks like and could only imagine from some related poems. However, in 1987, a historical site was discovered and 14 pieces were found. The next period between 960 and 279 A.D., when five famous kilns were founded and used. These five kilns were located in different parts of China and specialized in different kinds of pottery. The Ru King agate was added to the glaze, and for the Guan King, they make pottery exclusively for the royal family. And mostly made the celadon. Pottery made in the Gurkin is famous for its crackles, which are called the golden thread and iron wire. Pottery made in the Jinkin shows different colors, such as purple, red, and green. Dinkin is famous for its white pottery. The next period is dominated by the blue and white pottery. 
This is a type of porcelain with a white background and blue paintings. Later in the Qing Dynasty, it is a period of great success in the history of Chinese porcelain making, especially in Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong dynasties. That time is called the High Qing, when economy and pottery making technology reached an unprecedented peak. These three emperors, they are grandfather, father, and son, but they showed very different aesthetics in terms of pottery. During the Kangxi dynasty, the grandpa, pottery was masculine and vigorous, and were mostly decorated with landscapes, flowers, and birds, character stories, and long inscriptions. Pottery made in the Yongzheng dynasty, the father, was elegant, small, and exquisite. It was mostly decorated with patterns, slender, and soft lines, and a great variety of glaze colors. He believed in minimalism, thinking less is more. On the contrary, the son Qianlong believed that more is the best, and pottery made during that time was magnificent and gorgeous, and was mostly decorated with patterns showing good fortune and special meanings. The Qianlong dynasty is a period with great success and progress in pottery making technology. One of them is the bionic pottery. For example, you may think vessels shown in the first two pictures, they are made of wood and bamboo, but actually they are pottery. This is an imaginary dialogue between the three emperors. If they had a dialogue regarding pottery art, although people often laughed at Emperor Qianlong's farmhouse aesthetics, the difference in aesthetics is largely due to the times. Compared to the two previous dynasties, people in the Qianlong dynasty have learned more from the Western culture, especially the Baroque and Rococo styles. As a result, mainstream aesthetics of the upper class values complexity and luxury. Furthermore, there has been a great success in pottery manufacturing technology. For example, in the picture, you can see a vase named the Pottery Mother. From top to bottom, it included 17 different layers and thus 17 different steps and uh, ways of firing. In order to get one like this, you need to succeed in all steps. Do you know what the estimated success rate is? As low as 0.23%. The Emperor Qianlong ordered this once so as to show the advances in pottery manufacturing technology during that time. Finally, the emperor himself liked elegant objects, which promoted the innovation and development of pottery. Now let's move on and show you how pottery is made. Please watch a video clip. It was filmed in an ancient kiln, where craftsmen exhibit the whole pottery making process.
Thanks for watching the video clip. You can tell from this clip that the first step is clean refining. As kaolin is originally a clean stone, you need to make porcelain clean out of the porcelain stone and remove all the impurities. The second step is throwing or model making. That is when you put the clean ball on the turntable and knead out the preliminary porcelain shape. Yes, the turntable is a work table that keeps on turning. The third step, fettling or hand grinding. That is when you place the adobe or porcelain on the turntable and spin it with knife to make it make the thickness of the blank suitable and smooth on both of the inside and outside. The fourth step, drying. The adobe was placed on a wooden rack to dry, as shown in the picture at the bottom. The fifth step, carving. Sophisticated craftsmen use a knife to engrave patterns on the dried body. And then it comes to the next step, drawing patterns on porcelain. For blue and white porcelain, paint patterns were drawn before glazing for artistic creation. However, for some other kinds of pottery, paint patterns were added after glazing and initial firing. The above two steps were actually they are not mandatory, as some pottery may not have any engravings or paintings. The seventh step is glazing. When craftsmen glaze evenly the inside and outside of the adobe, it seems easy, but actually it's not. Glaze dries very fast, and so you need to be sophisticated, glazing both quickly and evenly. The last, while sometimes not, step is firing pottery. Pottery products are put in a refractory ceramic container and then fired at high temperatures to form in a kiln. It may take a day to fire pottery, but more time is needed for it to cool down. Although we showed eight steps in pottery making, actually there are more small steps. Even more steps are needed if you need complicated pottery pieces. Different skills and craftsmen are needed in each of the steps. That is why pottery making is a very complicated technology and sophisticated craftsmen are needed in each of the steps. And one failure in any of the steps may turn into complete failure. Finally, I've introduced in the China as well as the words pottery capital. Xinzhe is located in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River in China as a part of the Jiangxi province. Xinzhen's ceramics are world-renowned and are known as the world's pottery capital. People in Xinzhen began to make pottery from the 22 AD, and in the 7th to the 10th century, they started to make blue and white pottery, what it, that is what it's mostly famous for. During the 13th and 14th century, Xinzhen started to make pottery for the royal family and soon became world known. At present, people in Xinzhen are trying to resolve the tradition. You may see from the picture on the left that people are, are celebrating refiring at a Ming Dynasty kiln. The ancient kiln has been out of use for 100 years. However, recently people have started to reuse it and so as to resolve the tradition. This kind of Asian kiln are fired for pottery once every month, and we are very fortunate to witness it on our filming trip to Xinjiang. And the picture on the right, craftsmen are taking pottery, which were installed in a ceramic container out of the kiln. Containers were opened immediately and pottery's pieces were shown to the entire crowd. Today in Xinjiang, you can experience the pottery making process. Here shows pictures of our students making pottery as a unique experience for our visit. 
Also, the ancient city is still full of energy and creativity. Young art students and craftsmen from all over the country and even the world, they gather in Jindezhen to exchange new ideas, learn new techniques, and also make a living. Tao Xichuan is a night market where artists and craftsmen sell their handcrafted pottery. We interview shop owners at the night market about their livings in Jindezhen and how they made. Their goods. Please watch our last video clip. Evening sun rises high above the horizon. Now we have arrived at Jindezhen Tao Xichuan Creative Center. 这里聚集了来自五湖四海的年轻创业者们，他们将自己的想象与热情注入到陶瓷艺术的创作当中。下面我们一起来看看吧。老板，你们为什么会来这里，就是做这个呢？因为我们就是读书的时候是学这个专业陶瓷艺术设计，所以然后毕业了就开始做陶瓷。对。啊。这里的东西都是自己做的吗？对，都是我们自己设计，然后自己做，然后自己烧制。对，我们每一个摊位都是不一样的，就是可能会有类似，但是东西是没有一模一样的，因为都是自己做的，都是的。嗯、老板你好，我们看你这个艺术品，感觉。很有意思的样子，就你能给我们简单介绍一下你的一个创作的灵感吗？嗯、呃，这是我基本上是从电影中找到一些元素，然后给它做了一些拼接。我平时会关注一些电影嘛，然后会把他们一些比较好的地方，哦，比如他的眼睛，然后他的鼻子、脚，都会给他做一些拼接，选取不同的一些物体作为这个拼接，给他做一个这么这么一个造型。老板你好，我看你这边正在做这个小瓷器，然后想问一下，你学这种手艺学了多长时间呀、啊？呃，一七年是做，一七年到一九年是跟师傅学做大的。啊、嗯。一九年七月份，然后自己尝试做这个小的，然后一直到现在，也大概有一年多吧。这个东西，工艺的话是自己琢磨的，然后但是也是基于传统技法的基础之上。然后把它表现成现在这个样子。啊、嗯Thanks for watching this video clip. At the end, this is a picture of our filming team in front of the Chinese Ceramics Museum. Two of my students, they served as guides in these video clips. And the other students, they're actually uh, undergrads in journalism and advertising, who helped with shooting and film clip editing. As a summary from today's talk, you get to know the relationship between pottery in China and Europe, the history of Chinese pottery, how pottery is made, and also the pottery capital Jindezhen. You are welcome to Jindezhen to Jiangxi to experience the beauty of pottery art. Mm -hmm.